Our standard practice now is to separate out those equations that basically define the degrees of freedom that are constrained. So in this case, we can partition out the first and the third equations and set them aside. And it's the second and fourth equations that involve the unknown quantities that are displacement-like, which are the rotations in our problem. So we've solved for those rotations, and then that physically defines the displacement field, which I've sketched below. As an afterthought, we can find the reactions from the equations that had been set aside, and we get minus 5,000 newtons at each of the support points, as sketched here. That makes sense because we know that they had to equilibrate the 10,000 newton upward load. What we have just done is to develop the stiffness matrix and the equivalent nodal load concept in the XY plane for bending of an Euler-Bernoulli beam. Now it turns out that we really need to embed that beam into three dimensions so that we can do what is called a space frame. Furthermore, you really need axial force in the linear sense and torsion effects in order to do a typical frame problem. We're not going to attack the problem of buckling of those members, which involves really nonlinear axial effects. In order to embed in three dimensions, we need the degrees of freedom shown here. And a beam element then has 12 such degrees of freedom, six at each end. There are three translations and three rotations at each end. Now the beam that we just finished was for bending or flexure it's called in the XY plane. So the example problem we gave involved a V deflection upwards. We're now going to call that coordinate at the nodes the U2 coordinate and the rotation that was relevant would be the U6 coordinate. At the far end of the beam the same nodal positions would be held by U8 and U12. Now I'll gather that information for you in the next figure. Here's the newly interpreted results that we just found. That bending in the XY plane is given by a relation involving these coordinates. So what we need to do now is do the same thing in the XZ plane. And it really requires a re-derivation. There's a problem because the coordinate system is awkward in this case, that you find that the evaluation at a node for rotation becomes the negative of the slope. You might say that it's a little bit of a conflict between the finite element notation and the classical beam sign conventions. But it's OK. We can overcome that. It shows up as a minus sign in this relation. And it's precisely for that reason that I developed the beam element in the XY plane rather than the XZ. Now, some textbooks will take the XY plane, some will take the XZ. Sometimes textbooks will uh, flip the Z coordinate downward in order to avoid this problem and then have the W deflection positive upwards. And then they don't get this paradox of coordinates here. But for us, we've got to use a consistent approach in three dimensions. So we resolve that by this introduction of a minus sign in these slope relations. And that turns out to cure the problem, but actually gives a different stiffness matrix. Here is this stiffness matrix in the XZ plane. And it involves the coordinates 3, 5, 9, and 11. The new thing will be that there are some minus signs occurring in the interior of the stiffness matrix. And you can compare it with the one in the XY plane and see where those fall. OK, so we've got the flexure problem pretty much in hand. Now let's look at, uh, say, the axial tension. The linear theory we already did for the line element and found this nice pattern of in and out forces on the element. In our new coordinate system, that involves the first and the seventh coordinates with the first and the seventh forces.
development of the torsional stiffness for the beam element follows the same logic as the axial stiffness. Here I show the two rotational degrees of freedom at the ends, and there would be torques associated with those uh, rotational degrees of freedom. It will turn out that you get a similar stiffness form, namely this nice plus minus one pattern, and that's due to the fact that this is a statically determinate structure where the torque at one end has to be reacted by the opposite torque at the other end. The material properties are captured in the G, or the shear modulus, and then the geometric effects are captured in the cross-sectional torsional rigidity J, and then the length of the element L. The relevant coordinates, as we've mentioned, are 4 and 10. The beam element is actually one of the most complicated elements in that it exercises all six coordinates at each of its two ends, making it a 12 degree of freedom element. In addition, you have to specify the cross-sectional inertial properties. And in order to do that, we need to develop element coordinates. In the NASTRAN series of codes, this is how it's done. There's an underlying set of coordinates called a basic set of coordinates. And then when you mention that there's a beam element in the offing, you specify the connectivity from grid A to grid B. When you do that, that automatically gives you an X element coordinate direction, which is centered at node A and pointed toward node B. Then an artificial vector V is created and it's centered at this node A and points off into a direction specified by the user. That will define what's called plane 1 and I've shown it cross-hatched in red as the plane that passes through this vector V and the axis of the beam. You can automatically then infer that there's a plane 2 which is perpendicular to that first plane and also passes through the beam axis. So those two planes then specify orthogonal local planes and when you specify a moment of inertia I1, that's a moment of inertia that is relevant to the beam flexure in plane 1. And then I2 is the relevant moment of inertia that deals with flexure in plane 2. It turns out that in classical mechanics, a different notation is often used where the moments of inertia might be called IY and IZ and deal with preventing motion or flexure about the y-axis and about the z-axis, which are local element coordinates. That was the way that I learned, and I was a little suspicious of this business of using these planes, but it turns out to work very well, and now I'm pretty well converted to the NASTRAN way of defining moments of inertia. Let's look at the stiffness matrix for a beam element that has both torsional and axial effects included, as well as the flexure in the two planes. This becomes a 12 by 12 matrix, and notice that I'm using the convention from the NASTRAN series of codes with I1 and I2. The zeros are not shown here, so you can imagine them embedded in all the remaining positions. This makes kind of a nice uh, checkered pattern here. You won't see this matrix given in many books. In fact, I've personally not seen it presented, but yet this is the three-dimensional beam element, which is possibly the most widely used stiffness matrix in all of finite elements. And notice then that you get these minus signs occurring on some of the terms, which again have to do with that coordinate conflict between the classical and the finite element coordinate systems in the XZ plane.
we've completed quite a lengthy study of the Euler-Bernoulli beam, which is sometimes called the simple beam, and its conversion into an element, and the addition of axial and torsional effects, and finally the embedding into three dimensions. This is a rather complete study, then, of the simple theory. But there are advanced topics, and they're really beyond the scope of our course. I'll just mention those in this figure. For instance, when you get length to depth ratios of less than 10 in beams, you start getting into deep beam effects where you should really consider shearing deformation. And I've sketched that here to show that this deep beam, initially a rectangle, might shear into this form here, where now you get angles that are other than 90 degrees between the cross-section and the elastic axis. The reason that this happens is that the bending stiffness, as a beam becomes thicker and thicker, varies as the depth cubed but the shearing stiffness only varies as the depth to the first power. And therefore, relatively speaking, deep beams are able to do shearing deformation more easily than they do in slender beams. So be aware that there is a deep beam theory. Civil engineers sometimes are interested in this because some of the beams used in railroad bridges and, and other civil structures do become deep like this. Another category of advanced problem is when you have thin walled bodies. Their torsional characteristics are are relatively easy if it's a closed thin wall and, and a compact section. But as you go to open walled cross sections, such as this slit tube here, you find that the torsional stiffness is really degraded. Likewise, if you have built up sheet metal structures. And the automobile industry is very interested in these thin walled open cross sections. This has led to the development of advanced beam elements such as the beam element in the Nastran series, particularly in the MSC Nastran code. So uh, within that uh, series of codes, it's really the bar element that is the Euler-Bernoulli beam element. And then in MSC Nastran, the beam element has many of these advanced features. One that I haven't mentioned yet is that really the location of the nodes at the end of an advanced beam element is put at the line of shear centers, not the uh, centroidal axis nor something else having to do with mass distribution, perhaps a mass axis. So even the definition of the nodes that define such an advanced beam is an interesting question in itself. Problem one in our problem session is that of a cantilever beam with end displacements prescribed. Here is a one meter long cantilever beam and we're going to enforce a vertical displacement of two millimeters at the tip, as well as one-tenth radian rotation. The question is, what is the shear force generated by the wall on the beam? I've tried to make that somewhat of a physical statement. What we're really asking for is the external reaction in the vertical shear. And we want to determine what direction it is, just to make sure that we understand the sign convention. The bending stiffness of the beam is given, so we have all the physical quantities for the stiffness matrix. In solving such a problem, it's wise to block out the total size of the system and try to identify the boundary conditions. In our case, we just have one element defining our system, and it will have four degrees of freedom. So we know that we're going to have a four by four system stiffness matrix, a four vector of displacements, and a four vector of forces. This problem is particularly easy because we've been given all four displacements. So it's definitely in the tradition of the displacement boundary element method that you specify the displacements and that causes forces. But it is an unusual way to state a boundary value problem. Our goal is to find the force F1 at the left wall, 
and determine its sense. You see, we're lifting up on the right end and we're rotating it, and it's not clear what sense that should be. My first guess would be that it would be a downward force trying to restrain the upward force causing this displacement U3. The solution is actually just a forward multiplication in which we can solve the first equation for F1. And when we do that, we get a total value of 57,600 newtons. Because it's positive, that means it's upward. And that's a little bit counterintuitive. However, it shows that the rotation that has been applied at this right end uh, actually is tending to put somewhat of a downward thrust on the body and overcomes the vertical displacement. And so the reaction has to be upward as shown. Problem two is an assembly of a rod and a beam element. The beam is a cantilever beam extending vertically from a rigid wall. And then the rod is connected by a pin end to the beam and extends to a wall where it also would be pinned by definition because a rod cannot carry bending moments. The pin joint that's the common joint won't transmit bending moments from one to the other. The question is, under 1,000 Newton load, at 45 degrees angle is shown, what is the horizontal deflection of that pin joint? You're given all of the material properties and geometric properties of the two elements, one meter long beam and 800 millimeter rod in length. In our solution, we'll first sketch out the required degrees of freedom for the assembly. And it turns out there are seven. We would set up the beam, first of all, as a cantilever beam fixed at the wall, extending upwards. And we'll take a set of local coordinates as shown. That alone requires six degrees of freedom. Then the rod, if we want to make life easy for us, we'll make an element coordinate system lined up to include the U5 that we've already defined, and then pick a U7 at the wall aiming in the left direction also. We know that the beam matrix would in general be a 4x4 four four matrix if we only consider flexure and we don't worry about axial and torsional stiffnesses. Ultimately, we're going to constrain all of the degrees of freedom at the wall where the cantilever beam is fixed, as well as the wall where the rod is pinned. So we will end up with a three by three problem, ultimately. I'll write down the assembled stiffness matrix for this system. And here we can put in the relevant boundary conditions. I'm showing the zeros for the wall where the cantilever beam is fixed, and then the zero in the horizontal degree of freedom at the wall for the rod. It's at those degrees of freedom that we don't know what the reaction forces are. So those are shown as F1, F2, F3, and F7. At the joint, however, we do know the external force in those degrees of freedom 4, 5, and 6, namely that there is a component of force, 707 newtons, in the horizontal and vertical direction, but there is no external moment supplied. And so we do meet our criterion that we must specify one or the other of the force or the displacement component in each degree of freedom. And you can just go down this whole list of degrees of freedom and see that that's true. At this point, we would partition out the degrees of freedom that are given as constrained. In other words, the first, second, third, and seventh equations. And that would leave us with the interior three equations that correspond um, to this matrix that I'm trying to outline here.
And when we separate those out, we see that the first equation uncouples from the second and third. So we can solve two equations simultaneously and then solve the third one at our leisure. When we do that, we get these two simultaneous equations and we can eliminate U6 since it's U5 that we're interested in. Solve for it. It involves both the beam stiffness contribution and the rod stiffness contribution. Remember that those stiffnesses are conductors of force and they both are essentially trying to restrain that horizontal motion U5 from occurring. When you solve for U5, you get the answer of 1.66 millimeters. It's positive, which was to the left in the way we set up our coordinate system. And so that's a reasonable answer. It's in the reasonable direction. And so we accept that as, as the correct answer. Problem three is a cantilever beam with a spring at the tip and then a live load in the vertical direction at the tip. This will give us some practice in studying a system with springs. Here's a figure that shows the 5,000 Newton load downward, uh, the 10,000 Newton per millimeter spring. The beam itself is two meters long and we'll pick the XY plane as a plane of interest. Then we're given the Young's modulus and the stiffness in bending using the IZZ notation as the kind of moment of inertia that opposes rotation about the z-axis. Our system has five degrees of freedom. That's because I'll choose to model the spring as a part of our elastic system and will model both ends of the spring including the grounded end. Now, of those five degrees of freedom, three of them are constrained to be zero, or in other words, they are grounded. So I'll enter the zeros in these three locations. The beam has terms entering in its normal positions and then shows up in these locations. The spring will contribute stiffnesses in these four locations. After we realize that there are zeros, we understand that these columns, the first, the second, and the fifth, will vanish because they're multiplied by zeros. Also, we recognize that we can set aside the equations that correspond to those zero displacements and set them aside to find these blue boxed reaction forces later. So then we have a set of two equations in two unknowns remaining involving the unknown displacements. Now there's a modeling concept here which is important and that is that when you have a spring attached to a mechanical system that it will add a term on the main diagonal. You can, as I did, show the grounded end of the spring, but it will always cancel out of the problem. So as a result, many people are quite happy to just include the spring on the main diagonal. Another trick that people do sometimes, which I don't recommend so much, is to treat the spring as an external force and to put a force out there to be minus K times the displacement that's relevant, which in our case would be U3. That treats the spring as an external force and then it must be later incorporated into the left side of the equation. Now let's solve the resulting two by two set of equations. Those equations are shown here with the live load acting, the 5,000 newtons downward on degree of freedom U3, and then the zero tip moment applied. When we put in the numerical values, we come up with a matrix such as this. And then we can solve that either by elimination of variables as we've learned in high school or perhaps using Kramer's rule as shown here. 
in Kramer's rule, it's a ratio of determinants. And what you do is substitute in the first column of the system of coefficients the live load on the right side. That will give us a solution for the first component of the unknown vector. In the denominator, you have the determinant of the full coefficient matrix. And the answer turns out to be one half millimeter downward, which is a negative number. So that completes our problem session. I'd like to have another short interview here in regard to the beam element by just talking with someone that has been doing finite element modeling and analysis for some years now. His name is Peter Grimley and he's an employee of automated analysis. So I went out into our working area and kind of grabbed Peter by the neck and said, Peter, we need some good input, some practical insight as to how the beam elements are used in practice today. And so I'd like to ask you something along the line of what percentage of the elements do you use that are beams and then can you give some applications where beams have been useful to you? As Professor Anderson said, I'm Pete Grumley from Automated Analysis Corporation. I've been working in the industry using finite element analysis techniques for approximately three years. Um, I'm here to discuss a little bit some of the applications of the beam element. One of the first applications that we uh, typically use the beam element for is in the automotive industry to simulate ribbing um, and other stiffeners in floor pan uh, models. Another typical application of the beam element is in large space frames for uh, earth moving vehicles. For Caterpillar, for instance, uses large structural steel tubing to develop their frames for their large vehicles. The final outcome of the model is, tip is typically a plate and solid element with some beam elements included, but as an original or initial concept model, we'll build the entire structure out of beam elements with the appropriate cross-sectional properties. This helps us determine load path and potential areas of high stress where we'll need to refine our mesh in a later model. As Professor Anderson said, I'm Pete Grumley from Automated Analysis Corporation. I've been working in the industry using finite element analysis techniques for approximately three years. Um, I'm here to discuss a little bit some of the applications of the beam element. One of the first applications that we uh, typically use the beam element for is in the automotive industry to simulate ribbing um, and other stiffeners in floor pan uh, models. Another typical application of the beam element is in large space frames for uh, earth moving vehicles. For Caterpillar, for instance, uses large structural steel tubing to develop their frames for their large vehicles. The final outcome of the model is, tip is typically a plate and solid element with some beam elements included, but as an original or initial concept model, we'll build the entire structure out of beam elements with the appropriate cross-sectional properties. This helps us determine load path and potential areas of high stress where we'll need to refine our mesh in, in a later model.